Okay, so let's go ahead and start with an overview of concurrent programming. And uh, what I'll focus on here are some of the key concepts associated with concurrent programming. And then we'll talk in the next part of the lesson about how these concepts are realized in, in Java. Before we can talk about concurrent programming, let's talk about sequential programming, which is what you've been doing most of your time, most likely. So sequential programming is a form of computing that executes the same sequence of instructions and always produces the same results. So I like visual metaphors, as you will discover very quickly. And so a good example of sequential processing would be the drive-through lane at a fast food restaurant, where it's done sequentially, right? So you kind of go in order. And uh, it, it doesn't matter if this person in this car just wants to get a, a soda. They're going to get stuck behind everybody else who are doing something more complicated. So it's one thing at a time, and you always have the same result. In other words, the, the results of the execution is deterministic. If you look at the code, you can see what it's going to do. And in fact, there are two key characteristics of sequential programs. One is that the textual order of the statements specifies the order in which they execute, or at least they logically execute. The hardware is given some freedom to rearrange things if the result has no, um, if, if the result of the rearranging things doesn't affect the result of the computation. So here's a very, very simple example from the ArrayList source code from Java. This is the get method on Java's list or array list. And you can see here it first calls range check to see if the index is in bounds. And assuming it is, and no exception is thrown, then we get the element that is that that is that uh, is at that index location. And one of the key points of a sequential implementation is that the range check method must be called before we access the element data method. So no surprise, you guys have done this a lot. The other thing to note here is that successive statements must execute without any temporal overlap. So at least logically, they're executed one at a time. So think about you know pushing the dominoes, each one falls, and it knocks the next one down. But assuming that there's no wind or something like that, dominoes further down don't start to fall before the one ahead of it knocks into it and knocks it down. OK, so that's sequential programming. Now, to be honest, a lot of what we'll be doing here is also sequential programming, but we're going to also be focusing on concurrent programming. So what's concurrent programming, and how does that compare and contrast with sequential programming? So concurrent programming is a form of computing where threads can run simultaneously. And we'll talk about what a thread is here, because that's crucial to make sense out of this. And you'll also notice, again, I try to put these links at the bottom of each of the slides, just in case you're, you're curious and want to learn more. So here's an example where we're going to spawn a bunch of threads. And I'll talk about that in a second. So let's say, for sake of argument, that we're going to loop for i equals 0, i less than s max, where s max is 5. And so we're going to go ahead and create a new thread for each time through the loop. And I'm going to represent threads with these funny little squiggles. They look like a piece of thread with an, an arrow. The arrow is the instruction pointer, which is where we are in the computation in that thread. And each of the threads is going to run some computation. We'll come back and talk about that more in a second. So what is a thread? A thread is a unit of execution for streams of instructions that can run concurrently on one or more processor cores. So a lot of important things here. First of all, I can almost guarantee you that quiz one will ask, what is the definition of a, of a thread? So it's, it's good to, to remember what that is. So concept thread is, is something that can execute. What does it execute on? It executes on one or more processor cores. At any given point in time, a running thread is typically running on one core. But over the life cycle or the lifetime of the thread, it might end up being running on more than one core, although only one core at a time. And I represent these as cores. So we have, this is a four core machine running, in this case, five threads. We'll talk more about that later. Any questions about, at a high level, what a thread is? So it's basically a way of getting things to run. Now, for a sequential program, there's also a thread there, too. There's something that's executing those instructions sequentially. It's just that there's typically only one thread. And it's usually the main thread, or sometimes 
depending on the, the platform you're involved with, the user interface thread. So user interface thread, main thread, one thread. Now, it turns out that all of these threads could either run in parallel on multiple cores, or they could be multiplexed over a single core. Although this is getting increasingly rare, because it's getting increasingly hard to buy processors that only have one core. And the reason for that is because of Moore's law. We have so many transistors, people are like, well, let's just make more cores, right? Um, so it's very, very hard to buy a single core computer these days. Now, how does concurrency and concurrent programs differ from sequential processing and sequential programs? Different executions of a concurrent program may produce different instruction orderings. And those orderings are often non-deterministic. In fact, that's what makes concurrency so powerful and so frustrating, because things don't always execute in the same way at the same time every time. So here's a couple of things to think about in this regard. And we will cover this over and over again throughout the course, so you'll get lots of chances to think through. The textual ordering of the source code doesn't define the order of execution. Remember the example I shared you before where for the get method and array list, range check had to be called before we access the index location and element data? That was sequential. In this case, we're going to start three threads for computation A, computation B, computation C, but there's nothing that requires these computations to run in any particular order. C could run before A, B could run before C. As things run over a period of time, threads may be suspended and resumed. So there's nothing that's inherently ensuring that computation A finishes before computation B, before computation C. Unless, of course, you do extra things behind the scenes with synchronizers, but let's ignore that for now. So the key point is we don't really know, we don't really care, actually, at one level, whether A goes before B goes before C. That's non-deterministic. And it's really up to the operating system and the hardware and other layers of software and the software stack, like the virtual machine and so on, to decide what order things are going to run in. Another thing to remember, and this is really important, operations are permitted to overlap in time, to overlap temporally. Remember with the sequential programming? We said that they, they have to execute in a way that is ordered and they don't overlap temporally. With concurrency, things can be going on at the same time. The instructions can overlap, especially on a multi-core platform where you've got multiple physical units of, of parallelism to run things literally physically at the same time. And this is important. The reason why this matters is because if you start trying to access shared resources, you have to be careful to protect them so that different threads that read and write those resources don't end up corrupting them in some bizarre way through something horrible called a race condition. We'll talk about that later. So more things can happen, but you can over, the, the system can overlap the, the operations in non-deterministic ways that have temporal overlap. And that is, again, both a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because it allows us to be able to make things run faster, it's a curse because when things go wrong, you're usually scratching your chin trying to figure out what the heck is happening. In real world programming, like all the stuff we'll be doing for our programming assignments, concurrent programming is often used to decouple the user interface thread, that's the one that talks to the user, and allow things to run in background threads. So work can be offloaded from the user interface thread and run by one or more background threads. And you'll see that that's, that architecture you see here is going to be shown over and over and over again throughout this course with different mechanisms plugged in to do all the different features. Now here's the way it works at a high level. The background threads, the ones that are running, that are not the user interface thread, the ones that are in a pool typically, those threads can block. And what that means is if they need to wait for I.O., like they're downloading an image or they're waiting to get a palantiri or whatnot, those threads can block in that circumstance. And that's fine. In contrast, the user interface thread, and there's only one of them, does not block. Or if it blocks, it has to block for a very, 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 very short period of time. So you want to do long running intensive, either I.O. or CPU intensive processing in background threads, those things can afford to block. 
and the user interface thread cannot afford to block. And anybody who's watching NFL football these days, that's, that's a blocker, right? That's, that's what that is. <laughs> so these guys can block, the UI thread cannot block. Very important thing to remember, and a lot of the stuff we'll be doing in the class will be based on that assumption that the user interface thread doesn't block, the background threads can block. And here's where it gets interesting. So, so that's just threading, right? That's just threading 101. You can block in background threads, you can't block in the user interface thread. And anytime you want to share state between either the user interface thread and the background threads or between background threads that are running concurrently on different cores or whatever, that state, especially mutable shared state, must be protected by synchronizers to avoid concurrency hazards. And we'll talk in just a moment about some examples of concurrency hazards. But uh, that's what makes things tricky. Getting things to run in parallel, not, not that hard. Getting things to run concurrently, not that hard. Getting things to run concurrently so you don't end up stomping all over other resources and corrupt the state of your program, a little more tricky. Okay, so that's the end of the overview of concurrent programming.